This is an image of each one of us. This is a powerful image of Threshold. It's a large painting. Uh, it's in the Los Angeles County Museum. It's a contemporary painting by an Hispanic man. And it's a very powerful experience. You can imagine if it's a powerful experience, just seeing it here hugely decreased in terms of size. Uh, how Im impressive it is in, um, when you're actually standing before it. So each of us got to this point and we faced curtains that were closed. The th thrust of the commitment in this taking hold of the cloth and pushing it aside to enter the unknown the intensity of that red, the intensity of uh, color, the only place of, of color um, in the painting, the, the central focus of that, the intensity of her body, the uprightness of that backbone. Everything about the experience, this image, is, is an act of determination and an, an act of uh, placing oneself um, into a place of commitment to entering the unknown. Images of threshold are everywhere because it's one of the archetypal experiences in our life of the imagination, life of the human imagination, images of threshold are everywhere. The reasons I love to talk about these archetypal images or archetypal themes is that once you get them in your imagination, and, I'm, and these of course are, will not be un unfamiliar to you, but once they are in your imagination, that you, will, you yourself will find the images everywhere in your own lives. This is an extraordinary image from India and it's a devotional, a devotional piece on an altar. I don't know how, how large it is, but I don't think it's very large. When it first flashed on, you might have thought that these were eyes, but in fact these are rings. There would have been a rod through those rings and from the rod would be hanging some kind of cloth. The devotee would have come forward removed the veil, uh, removed the cloth, and uncovered this <coughs> emptiness, this, this void. And the image you're looking at is in fact the image of void, the image of Aditi, who is the, uh, one of the Indian uh, goddesses of the void, of infinity, of that place of beginning of the aboriginal emptiness, dark emptiness uh, of, of the universe as we know it. And we know that the void, the dark void, is the given and light is the miracle. That in fact darkness is the aboriginal womb and that moments of light have been explosive energies inside that void that matter, that darkness of aboriginal origin. This is an astonishing image of this. First of all, you see that she is seated. Many of the great goddesses, the great mothers through time are seated for obvious reasons. 
because their lap is the center of origin. Their lap is the center of the universe. So here is the seated mother. She hears us coming. Look at the size of these ears. She hears us approach. Her arms come forward to welcome us. Her legs open to receive us into the intimacy of her presence. The fact that psychologically we move upstairs into into her physicality. It's a beautiful, beautiful, incredibly simple image of the Great Mother. And the understanding that in fact as we are moving toward her, she herself is waiting, awaiting our approach. We have these, uh, these dark entrances uh, all through time and um, in sacred places all over the world, whether they are actual cave entrances or, in this case, um, a, a Buddhist temple carved into uh, uh, an original rocky cave-like surface. This is a temple in Bali. And as I'm sure you know, many of these threshold places are often guarded by sacred spirits and the spirits are here and the spirits are very often uh, fierce looking and the fierceness is not a fierceness in the sense of go away the fierceness is uh, a fierceness that stops you in your tracks and says to you are you ready to enter this sacred place are you prepared? Do you know that you are going into this place of where she is, where she is waiting for you? So that the guardian spirits of any place are not there to, to say, go away, but they are simply there to define for you a secular space as opposed to a, 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 a sacred space. And here, although there is no line draw drawn in the sand, so to speak, when you are on this side of this invisible threshold, you are in, you are approaching sacred space, but you are not yet there. When you cross that line, you have entered into the mystery of sacred space. Back into the dimmest uh, prehistory. Both snake and bird, bird goddess and snake goddess, were highly developed in this society on this island of the huge island off the, the very bottom of, uh, of Greece, in the Aegean. So she is in her cave and the devotees are looking down in a very familiar way, two women up here on the roof of the, uh, of, of the little temple. I want you to just look at this in terms of the simplicity of this. Many of the slides I choose, I choose because they are not great works of art. They are great works of worship. They are great images of intent in terms of worship, in terms of making present the world of the spirits. This is something that any of you could make. A bit of clay, a, a, a bit of spending time, so that uh, I hope that you will carry away from our four days together that you yourself, um, if you don't already, can without, with very little effort uh, make images out of your own spirituality, images to serve your own soul, images to serve the soul of your family, working with your children, working with your grandchildren, working with your friends, to, to work those experiences into your lives. Um, and all the time creating side by side, telling stories side by side, telling your dreams side by side. Um, this in fact, the very image that we are looking at could easily have been an image of a dream. As I throw that out verbally, and now you look at it, you can see how uh, this could have been a manifestation uh, of, a, of a woman's uh, dream. And here we have uh, two 
great dogs guarding the threshold. So again, it's this threshold into the unknown. The understanding that we approach, we approach, we approach, we approach. Our journeys come from many different places. The places are as different as each one of us is different from the rest of everyone else. But all of our movement toward her, toward the spirit world, is one of increasing commitment and focus. And the threshold is another expression of that focus. Two divine animals from the beginning of time, from the beginning of imagery, we know that dogs and horses are the, are the animal energies and images of the threshold. So the great guardians of the threshold, um, uh, these two uh, spirit animals in my own life. Uh, my, my life is uh, filled with uh, many different spirit dogs from, from the time I was a, a child. The, the animals are not saying to you like that huge uh, a spirit head carved above the, uh, the entrance into the temple in Bali. They're not saying to you, go away. They are simply telling you to, to be focused, to be aware of the energy you are moving toward. In the mythology of um, Coyote in the Southwest, Coyote is said in these tales, T-A-L-E-S, tales, stories, <laughs> um, that Coyote carries his energy at the tip of his nose and in his tail, especially at the tip of his tail. And in my own living with, with, with animals, I assume that many of you have dogs and have lived with dogs, you know how important that nose tail is in relationship to, to dog energy. Uh, that both are places of the most intense um, communication and manifestation of communication. Um, the, the dog's tail wags after the scent, not before the scent. So that both ends of the dog uh, are very important in terms of uh, its ability to express, to need the need to know and to express that moment of knowing. Uh, red is the predominant color. And that started happening coming out of a uh, year of, of illness because the year 2000 was not only major surgery, but I had very, very serious double pneumonia, uh, which hospitalized me and um, it took me a long, long time. So the year 2000 was really about my body speaking to me. This is obviously, uh, it's as simple as, as you see. Uh, we are inside a dark place looking out into light. So we are in, the, in a reverse place of threshold the way we have uh, been talking about it. We've been on the other side of the threshold looking into darkness. Now we're in a dark place looking into light. And this understanding of the reverse, how bright light is in the darkness. Uh, remembering always that darkness is the given and that light is the miracle. So this light penetrating this gate is, um, is a haunting image. It's, it's a very simple uh, photograph that I, um, I, I, I make a lot of my own slides um, and so I'm always looking for you know, new images. Those of you who know the quarterly uh, magazine called Parabola know that it's filled with um, beautiful sacred images, and this is um, this is one of the the photographs from that from that uh, quarterly magazine. The horse and the dog as guardians of the threshold, and therefore through time, in museums all over the world, all over the Western world, we have images of. The, of Persephone or the other goddesses associated with the equinox or springtime. Um, in this case, Persephone, we, we know it's Persephone because she's always shown holding a very, very large, or not large, elongated uh, torch, uh, the, the flame at the end here. This is uh, obviously a piece of sculpture from the uh, turning from BC into AD, let's say roughly the year 100, um, between 50 and 100 AD. It's Roman Celtic, a carving from a tombstone. 
So here is Persephone. Uh, she has risen from the darkness, recently risen. I mean, the, the flame is still, she's, she's only just, you know, come from the great uh, below. Her torch is still burning. And the first thing she does is greet uh, her threshold animals, her, this, this, this horse and, uh, and, and the dog. Um, all of it happening on itself in a, on a kind of a straight line of, uh, of a threshold experience. And I'm sure that you know that in fact horses are, are dogs. The horse evolved in terms of the, the gazillion millions of years uh, in the evolution of these animals that the horse evolved from the dog. The dog is the more ancient of the, of the two creatures. And those of you who have, who have spent time with both dogs and horses uh, know how similar they are in so many uh, different ways. So here is Persephone herself has crossed a threshold from darkness into, uh, into springtime. She will now walk the earth for the next six months of the year at the autumnal equinox where we are right now. We'll, we'll move back down into the cyclic dark half of the year. A beautiful image from Egyptian mythology. This image is an image of Nekhbet, the goddess of um, darkness, the goddess of the underworld. And she is the dark twin sister of Isis, who is the goddess of light, as you know. In the ancient Egyptian uh, spirituality, which of course lasted for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and not only although it originates in the southern Mediterranean, uh, all of those, uh, those great spirits, those great gods and goddesses from, from Egypt moved, moved all through um, the Mediterranean and were carried, of course, by sailors, by merchants, by the cross-fertilization of ideas from country to country. Of course, in northern France, um, on the river Seine, the still, bear, still carries the, the very name Isis in its very name, Paris, the place of Isis. And one of the most, um, most the hugest, most complex uh, temples to Isis although of course there were many in Egypt, but few even in Egypt could have been the size of, uh, of the one in Paris, which today, um, those of you who, who know Paris, uh, was in the entire left bank in the area called Saint-Germain-de-Prés, uh, which is a massive medieval monastery built over uh, and on top of uh, the, the ancient uh, sanctuary of Isis. As many of, uh, of course, uh, after in the fourth century, after the Edict of Milan in 313, when Christianity was chosen among uh, half a dozen other active religions, but for several hundred years, all those religions all lived together until finally Christianity became uppermost and began to build over uh, the what had been uh, temples to the great gods and goddesses from the classical world. So here is uh, Nephthys, the goddess of uh, darkness, the goddess of night. Uh, in Egyptian iconography, these wavy lines filled with these like polka dots represent the underworld. Now the underworld in no way means a place of um, of sin and, or, or, or punishment, uh, a, a place of torment. It has nothing to do with the, with the Christian concept of, uh, of sin and, um, and, and condemnation and punishment. Um, remember now that the archetypal world we're, we're, we're considering is the understanding that we are standing on a flat place called Earth. And above Earth is the great dome of heaven and below earth is the great dome of the underworld. And one is a place of a changing uh, uh, light and day, and of course that's the, the story of the, of the sun. And uh, the duat is the place of where the sun goes to sleep for the symbolic, uh, the darkness where the sun sleeps for the symbolic 12 hours each night. 
So what we're looking at is an image of the goddess of night who reaches up and pulls the old sun uh, down into her arms, down into the underworld where she will nourish the old sun during the symbolic 12 hours of night. The black fertile nourishing breasts of darkness, breasts of, of duat, so that the sun rises each day completely renewed, completely restored. The understanding of the, uh, of, of the day and night being symbolically 12 hours and 12 hours is part of the whole schema of uh, one of the schemas of uh, Egyptian mythology. So the old sun being pulled down into the nourishing breasts, the nourishing womb of darkness, being reborn 12, 12 hours later. The simplicity of this image, uh, and yet the enormously powerful, um, um, powerful statement, symbolic statement it's making about um, about a, a daily fact in our life, the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun. In the, in the schema, very often uh, the, the, the figure is just reduced to its most important elements. In this case, it's the arm and the dark breast. So that, keep that in your imagination, to be fed, to suckle each night, to fall asleep, to suckle to be revived, to be nourished all through your sleep, all through your darkness each night, and to receive what the night gives to you. Uh, you don't have to remember your dreams to awake being nourished by the gift of sleep, the gift of darkness, to abandon yourself uh, so that everything about you is reborn, your body is rested, everything about you is rested, your, your heart is rested, your, your soul is rested, your psyche is rested, that you give yourself into her arms, just as that image showed you, uh, falling asleep knowing that uh, you, you, you are being received into the arms of, uh, of sleep. Another image from Egyptian mythology, the understanding of death as threshold, because of course death is threshold. As we leave the threshold of our mother's body in birth, so psychically do we uh, leave uh, light and enter into darkness each night for our, for our regeneration. The darkness is always a place of regen generation, regeneration. We are generated in the darkness uh, in our mother's wombs and we move through life constantly being regenerated every 24 hours, psychically, physically, uh, spiritually, until finally we move to that edge and are released again into uh, the, the, the arms of, of darkness. Now in Egyptian mythology, the soul leaves the body and begins its journey through Duat, through this world of the underworld, uh, and moves toward going ever, getting ever nearer through various gates into the final, what's called the Hall of Judgment, um, the, uh, the Hall of Osiris, the great lord of the underworld. Uh, this represents, of course, the sarcophagus. Uh, here is the dark sun, when you see a dark black sun like that in Egyptian mythology, it means you are down in Duat. It's a black sun shining in, in the darkness. Um, in Egyptian iconography, the soul, uh, the soul having left the body, has left the body and yet stays with the body during this journey toward the hall until finally the, the, the soul reaches, stands before Osiris. A series of charcoal drawings I did um, maybe five or so years ago. Many of them are about the sacred dialogue, perpetual dialogue between the dog, the, the, the spirit over, over many years I've come to understand as the dog God, the lord of the threshold, the spirit guide, 
and this embrace with Crow Mother, my other spirit. So these are the two uh, primary spirits in my life and therefore uh, appear again and again and again in my imagery. From time to time, I stop painting and return to uh, charcoal. I also love working with um, simply with black inks on in, into uh, a white or a halftone um, textured uh, space. So the, this embrace, um, they are always facing each other in dialogue. Uh, they reach toward each other in this movement, um, movement toward the embrace. And in this particular uh, image, this, this black shape appeared. When it first appeared, as well it appeared first of all as just a, a hole, a square hole in the painting. And I saw it as an, as an entry place into this mystery of the sacred marriage between heaven and earth. The dog, of course, representing earth. The, the crow mother representing the powers of the above with her great uh, winged presence, but also, like coyote, gripping the earth, like the dog god. So the sacred marriage of heaven and earth, of the uh, great above and the great below. Uh, but then as the image evolved, uh, the, the dark shape took on a kind of, um, like a formal presentation, and I realized it could also be read as an altar. In other words, the, the place where the energy comes to focus. An altar is about where this, the spirit world, it's the place where the spirit world comes down and focuses 